Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Francis Fowle, and I'm the chair for the Association for Art History. And I'd like to welcome you all to this talk today, which is on the British Museum as a resource for art history. It's my huge pleasure to welcome the two speakers today, one of whom is actually an old colleague of mine at the National Galleries of Scotland. Um, uh, so I, first of all, I, I want to introduce Sarah Saunders, who is Head of Learning and National Partnerships at the British Museum. Um, she originally trained as a silversmith and jeweller in Birmingham and went on to lecture in art and design um, before getting her first job, which was at the, the v &A in London. Um, and there she created events and resources for students and worked on the interpretation for the uh, William and Judy Bollinger Jewellery Gallery. Um, as, and she's also worked on a, a range of um, photography, design and fashion exhibitions. Uh, and then in 2006, she moved to Edinburgh, working initially at the National, Gallery, National Museums of Scotland, I should say, and then at the National Galleries, where she was Deputy Head of Education. Um, then she moved to the new v &A in Dundee, where she worked uh, from 2013 to 2018. Um, and this, of course, is Scotland's first design museum, uh, where she was Director of Learning and Innovation. Um, so our second speaker is Hilary Williams, who is Education Officer for Art History at the British Museum in uh, the Learning and National Partnerships Department. She was previously a curator in the museum's Department of Prints and Drawings, and so has a background as a, as a curator. Um, and uh, she's a graduate of the University of East Anglia and the Courtauld Institute, uh, and published on the, the Dutch artist Rembrandt. Um, and recently, Hilary has created and produced the programme of public events to complement the British Museum's exhibition, Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint. So um, I'll hand over first of all to Sarah, and then um, she is going to hand over to Hilary, and then they will both hand back to me for the Q&A at the end. Um, and um, I'd like, as, as questions occur to you as you go along, just please just put them into the Q&A and I will field them and put them to Sarah and, and Hilary um, and hope there'll be a good discussion at, um, after the talk. Thanks then. Thank you so much, Francis. It's, it's great to see you and thank you everybody for coming. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, let's see if that's gonna work, here we go. Thank you so much for coming today. It's wonderful um, to see you all and to welcome you all. And this talk will really introduce you to the many ways in which you can use the British Museum as a resource for teaching and for learning about art history. Um, I'm not sure who's, who's come to this event today. We know it's, it's sold out, which is absolutely fantastic, but I'm hoping there's lecturers and students of art history and also just people that have a real passion for art history. Um, and I'm gonna talk through for the first part of the talk about out the different ways that you can use the museum as a resource. And then Hilary is going to talk more specifically about art history, um, some examples at, at the British Museum. So it's perfect timing to speak to you all um, at this start of the new academic year. And also, as we start to emerge from the pandemic, the picture on the screen there is the museum when we reopened um, last year in August and just how sparkling clean it was with all the staff had done so much work to, to get it like that while we were uh, closed. And we were so glad to open again. And it's so wonderful to see people in the museum and using the museum. And we look forward to welcome you, you all back. If you haven't been yet, you might be across somewhere else in the world, you might be somewhere else in UK will also talk about what we're doing around the UK and uh, globally. So um, I'm really keen also to hear from you today about things that we could perhaps do better to support you um, to as lecturers or students of art history. What are the sort of things you would like to see us doing? We'd love to hear your responses to that as well. And it's an important time in the museum's history as we uh, we have reopened after you know as after the after closing for such a long time and then thinking now about as we reimagine the museum for the future and and to be an ever more inclusive and uh, representative history of the world from multiple viewpoints and through different lenses like things like art history of course being important in that and when i was thinking about what i would highlight for this talk it was really clear to me that the museum is a resource for both art history, the academic discipline, and also the, the broader history of 
art, the global interconnected story of human creativity over at least 30,000 years or more. And when I say or more, it's because archaeologists are finding even older things um, created by humans um, around the world. So um, also new scientific research and technologies are enabling us to understand far more about how things were created and learn about their histories. So this the history of art is is huge and it's a, such a fantastic um, subject. So this is really what I'm going to try and cover in this first 20 minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the collection. Now, some of you, I hope, won't mind hearing this, that know our collection very well. Hope, I'm hoping there'll be some people that are new to our collection listening in as well. Um, so I hope you won't, you'll indulge us in just talking about some of these things. Collection online, how you can use our collections online. Exhibitions in London, installations, art installations, touring exhibitions around the UK, events, um, a really great way of connecting with us, and also group visits and tours and study room visits and library and archive visits. And, and also think a bit about ex, ex, how you can access the collection accessibility. So, um, uh, of course, all of these aspects of the work we do rely on hundreds of people, um, curators, educators, all of our different departments, all of our content creators for our online um, and very welcoming front of house staff, security, all of those people, everybody is so important to what we do at the British Museum and to helping support you to use the museum as an amazing free resource. And I know some exhibitions are charging, but so much of what we do is free, um, which is really fantastic. We also have an amazing array of volunteers at the museum, around 500 volunteers who we couldn't do without. So, um, uh, first of all, just a, a few things about reopening, uh, because we're not quite back to how we were before the pandemic yet, but we are getting there. So first of all, the collection, which is free for everyone to visit. At present, you do need to book um, your online visit still, and we're not still accepting group visits. We are just starting our schools visits, and then student visits will follow, we hope, shortly and uh, international and national tour visits as well. But we have started doing tours in the museum. We have started tentatively doing some face-to-face -face events. We had a huge event last weekend for Chusuk, the, the Harvest Moon Festival, the Korean Harvest Moon Festival, which was amazing. So we're tentatively, we're getting there, which is really positive. And as soon as we know when we're accepting student group visits, um, then obviously we will let you know. We'll, it'll be on our website as well it'll, and it'll be communicated. Um, however, you can book to come as an individual and you can book up to eight tickets for each person. So, so so that's uh, a way of you being able to visit. Um, the British Museum has around 8 million objects and around 4 million of which are able available to research on our collections online. And there are eight collections departments, Africa, Oceania and the Americas, Asia, Britain, Europe and prehistory, coins and medals, Egypt and Sudan, Greece and Rome, Middle East and prints and drawings. And the prints and drawings collection, uh, just for example, has around 50,000 drawings and around 2 million prints from the 15th century to the present day. And here are just some of the few of the fantastic works from that part of the collection. If you search in our collections online for pretty much any artist, um, it, you can be able to find them in our collection. So do have a look at that. Um, here's, here's just a few. So if we have there in the bottom left, a, a, a Raphael, a warrior, um, Henry Moore, some sketches by Henry Moore in the middle there. And then we've got a Cara Walker print in the top right hand corner, the American artist, contemporary artist, and Yinka Shonibare in the bottom uh, corner there. Um, let me just see if I can slightly move these out the way so you can see that which is a recent acquisition just in a, a set of these amazing prints called cowboy angels it from two from 2017 um so and then also as well as these examples from the modern era um the british museum's global collections obviously support learning about art, art the art of and culture of ancient civilizations and contemporary um uh culture 
culture from around the world. So um, here are some ancient examples. For, uh, for example, the on the left hand side, some of you will be very familiar with this, the, the Iron Sacri lovers, uh, 11,000 years old, found in Jordan and depicts uh, two people, a, a small sculpture of two people embracing in, in an act of love, um, possibly the earliest depiction of something like this. So really incredible uh, object. And then uh, on the right, something found fairly recently um, by a detectorist, a metal detectorist in, Sh in Shropshire, and that's now just gone on display at the Shrewsbury Museum and Art Gallery, and it's going on tour next year. And that's a Bronze Age sun pendant. Look at the look at that object it's absolutely incredible it will be featuring in an exhibition at the british museum next year and you'll be able to see it there or you'll be able to see it on a tour around the uk um, and then just uh, just very few examples here of of um, global history of art and artistic practice across the world so on the left um, an indian miniature from an album depicting the months of the year this one is I've got I've picked the one for September it's for August and September and you can see the, the 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 kind of monsoon season in this image and a time to stay indoors the menacing clouds and the rampaging elephants and tigers at the bottom um, which I, I really love these these prints and what they depict hopefully we won't get any rampaging elephants uh, in London um, so uh, and then we've we've got um, another uh, a Japanese drawing um, there on the right hand side as well and uh, a drawing uh, from Iraq uh, as well. The, the drawing at the top um, is uh, from our Hokusai exhibition um, which is coming up uh, very shortly at, at the British Museum in London and it's uh, uh, an exhibition on the great picture book of everything and these are rare prints that haven't been um, seen before um, on display so it's it's really great that we can show those they're quite small but they are really incredible and, and fantastic so um, we our website was redeveloped in 2019 and that was well we, we didn't realize this but how important that website was going to be when we had to close in March uh, 2020 so um, it, it it was, you know, it was just, we'd just redone it and it's just such a fantastic resource. The collections online as well then came back um, into play as well. Our collections online previously was really quite very hard to search. Uh, and now we hope it's going to be a lot easier for people to find objects and find out information about objects. You can also, this is the opportunity on that to download images as long as they're not being used for commercial purposes or to, you can buy images if you are using them for commercial purposes. But, um, you know, it's really great that there are free licenses for images and we've got 4, 000, 4 million objects on there and lots and lots of images. Not everything has an image, but lots of things do. And we're constantly updating that database to make the, the most recent information available. Also, if there's been any scientific work done, the likelihood is that will also be uh, available there for you to see or, or read about as well. So really great to have that. Um, the other things that you can do online um, are, you know, we, we have a blog, we've got podcasts, we've got lots of um, short videos and things like that. Lots of different ways of exploring the museum. You can also, we've got Google Street View, which is absolutely amazing. And you can actually explore the galleries from your home. And lots of people have said how brilliant that has been and how good it is if you, you're not going to be coming to London, you can still have a wander around the museum virtually. So that's been really exciting. Um, so, and this is on the collections online. We also have this collection online guide, which is really vital to kind of read through because it really helps you then suss out how to find the things you're looking for and how to, you know, make sure that you, you get the, the actual things that you're trying to find. Um, so do have a look at that as well, because it's really helpful in, in helping you navigate that new database, but we hope, do give us feedback on it. We hope it, it's much better than it was previously and we're constantly trying to improve it. So uh, 
exhibitions at uh, in London are, are a great way um, for us to provide a resource for art history. Um, it's we have had quite a few exhibitions that are art history related exhibitions, um, and that's I don't think a surprise because our current director Hartwig, Dr. Hartwig Fisher. It is it comes from an art history background and so uh, did Neil, Neil McGregor so it's it's great that we've got that really st this strength in in what we do and and quite often we have exhibitions relating to art history we also have fabulous um art and, art and design collections as well um so this here's just a few examples so this one is Rodan and the art of ancient Greece from 2018 um hopefully some of you might have seen that or attended some events for it and you know the really interesting thing is that lots and lots of artists themselves have used the, the collections for inspiration and Rodin was one of those people who came and studied the the Greek sculptures and and really from that um, his his work was inspired from that and this exhibition by the late Ian Jenkins um, who is, is much missed um, was was a, a huge success and and really great way of showing how you can use the the collections as a resource if you're an artist and uh, another one fairly recently and one that Francis uh, did a, a talk for us uh, for, which is thank you for doing that Francis, it's amazing. Um, Edvard Munch, Love and Angst uh, from 2019. And uh, yeah, and again, another great exhibition, a print exhibition, uh, building on what we have in our collection, but borrowing, uh, loaning a, a lot of objects for this one. So we're also bringing things to uh, the British Museum. And this one, uh, again, in 2019, inspired by the East. So the influence of uh, the Islamic world on, on art. Um, so really, again, it, this was very popular exhibition, a different uh, take. And the most recent one, Reflections, Contemporary Art of the Middle East and North Africa, which it was this year, um, a really great exhibition by Venetia Porter. And just a reminder really that we collect contemporary art from around the world. Um, we collect indigenous art, we collect all sorts of art from around the world. And our curators are always looking out for the latest works and to write about these as well. So it really is a wonderful uh, resource for, for that global art history. The other thing uh, that we've done quite a bit recently is installations and um, this one here, an amazing installation, The Library of Exile by Edmund, Edmund Duval. Um, sadly, this was only just installed as we closed um, for the pandemic, but uh, it did reopen after we opened again and we did we were able to extend it and we were able um, to film inside it with Edmund Duval and some other speakers and performers and the program of resulting events online was was really fantastic and a great success and you can watch those free on our YouTube events channel um, and the the Library of Exile, if you didn't see it or haven't heard about it, was created as a space to sit and read, and it housed more than 2,000 books in translation written by exiled authors. And we worked with English Pen, particularly on the programme for this. So our events and things like this installation, another way we can really connect with, with art history, um, but also with other disciplines like literature, for instance, and Edmund uh, has donated the books in this amazing installation to the University Library in Mosul in Iraq. And the original library, uh, as, as some of you might know, was completely destroyed by ISIS. So it's just such a fantastic um, uh, donation of, of him to give those books to that library. Um, and then when we reopened in August, uh, 2020. Um, we One of the things we reopened with, we asked Grace and Perry, who we're very lucky to have on our trustees, if we could have the, this um, installation, the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, um, with, you know, with the galleries closed, and then we opened with this, and it, it's really this object, and you might have been to the exhibition some time ago, 
uh, by Grace and Perry. But what it does is, is really it's to remind us that many artists throughout history have not been celebrated. We don't know their names and but whose incredible work we value and cherish and without which we would know nothing of our history of of our incredible world so it's a very poignant reminder of how important um, art and creativity is and craftsmanship and the pun about the it being a boat it's a craft and for the craftsman um, and it has uh, replicas of some of the museum's objects um, on on the ship so a very wonderful and poignant um, installation. So on to thinking about our, what we do around the UK. And in my department, we look after the national touring exhibitions. And so if you don't live in London, don't worry. Uh, through our national programmes, we aim to reach audiences of all ages across the UK, both with projects and with um, programmes like this. So. Um, this, uh, we do this through our touring exhibitions, our spotlight loans, partnership galleries where the British Museum objects are on long term loan, for instance, we have about 10 of those. Um, and we're working on one currently in Manchester, a South Asia gallery in Manchester, um, that's being co curated with around 30 people from Manchester who have South Asian heritage. And I've been involved in that from the start. It's an amazing project. It's the first all co-curated gallery we think in the UK that's been curated in this way it's it's astonishing and so we hope that's going to be opening um, later next year these two particular exhibitions I've pulled out because they're on now across the UK and they're both related to art so um, pushing pushing paper on the left hand side contemporary drawing from 1970 to now um, is uh, has been co curated as well we're very much now into thinking about how we work together with people to, to make sure we curate together with people in some of this work. And uh, it's going to be opening at the Cooper Gallery in Barnsley on the 2nd of October, and it's on till the 5th of February. So if you live in that part of the country, that's a great thing for you to go and see. Um, it's then going to go up to the Peer Arts Centre in Stromness uh, in Orkney. So I'm really happy um, that our national programme reaches every part of the UK. We've done things in Northern Ireland as well. We've, we've, we've also done things in Ireland recently. So every part of the UK we want to take things to, we want to get out as much as possible um, and go to places that perhaps we haven't been to before. Um, with topics ranging from gender and political activism to questions of belonging and human sexuality, the exhibition of 56 works will uh, showcase the diversity of contemporary drawing in that particular exhibition. And it's got so many different names that you'll know in it. David Hockney, Rachel White, Reed, Sol Levitt, Anish Kapoor, Tracy Emin, and, and some lesser known perhaps uh, artists, emerging artists, Hamid Suleiman and Rachel Duckhouse. So each partner venue will also um, add work so uh, I know they're going to be adding some work to that in the Cooper Gallery and that's what we try and do so it's really fits you know that area they they will curate and add works to the shows so living with art Picasso to Salmons um, another fantastic um, exhibition of of prints and drawings and it's the collection of one man that was left to the museum Alexander Walker the film critic for the Evening Standard and he collected artworks for pleasure and he had them all around his house all over his house in his bathroom in every room in the kitchen and there were these incredible artworks and it just reminds us how important it is to live with art you know we all have things on our I'm just looking here I've got a fantastic photograph on my wall here we live with art we people put things on walls and it, it you know why do we do that you know there's a reason for that so that's a wonderful exhibition to start thinking about how we live with art and why we choose things and uh, what they mean to us. Um, a huge amount of different artists in that show. He left about 200 works to the museum, but there's a, a, quite a lot of them are in this show. Um, so another way of connecting with us, I've briefly mentioned before, is about is, is coming to our online events. And uh, we, we had to pivot to doing this. We hadn't done any really online apart from school, uh, school events online, but we hadn't done any adult events online. But we've had enormous success with these. And we also started, my colleagues and Hillary's in the team that did put this together, um, 
at this British Museum Events YouTube channel, which has now got 13,500 subscribers. So do subscribe to it. And there you can see the reflections events that we, we did recently. You know, there's one there at home in the world, Syrian contemporary art. I mean, these are amazing talks. If you haven't seen them, do catch up with some of these. You can watch them at your leisure. They're completely free. Um, so it's it's really and we've been able to reach so many more people so we hope we're continuing with that we're definitely continuing but we're also trying to get back in-person events as well obviously because we want to do that a great way to find out about our events is subscribing to our e-newsletters on our website and um, also at these events we often have q a's so you can ask questions and it's a great way to really talk to curators get the experts opinions you know have discussion and debate with lots of people and we've had people coming from over half the countries in the world so it's been absolutely outstanding and incredible and last of all i just wanted to talk a bit about uh, a really important part of what we we have the resources we have at the museum particularly for lecturers students researchers um, study rooms the library and the archives so on our website, I've just put a few links here. Um, so with, if you go onto our website and go and search for resources, all of this will come up, lots and lots of different emails and phone numbers and all the different study rooms, the library and the archive. At present, we are only, they have reopened on the 13th, the study rooms on the 13th of September. However, just for individuals at present, but as soon as we can, we want to get groups back obviously into those study rooms. A lot of them are quite small. The principal drawings is a bigger one and we can have more people in that, um, but we're just still working through. So bear with us. We wanna get those up and running as soon as possible, but you can book as individuals now. So you can, you can make a visit and see some of those works close up and there's nothing better than seeing the original work in front of you not in a case and studying that in that way i mean you you can really learn so much our libraries are absolutely incredible as well an incredible resource um, and our archive um, has now moved and it's now located in the round reading room again you can make an appointment as an individual if you want to go and have a look at the archive um, and again that's incredibly fascinating for research as well um, when you uh, some of you will have been to and use the study rooms regularly i'm sure but some of you may not have and what i'm I've spoken to the teams about is how maybe next year we can look at developing events where we do induction events for lecturers and students so that we can show you those study rooms and actually induct you into how to use them if you haven't used them before anyone new to study rooms or libraries or archives. Um, this is something I did quite a lot at National Galleries of Scotland, which was wonderful and worked really well. Um, so I'd love to bring that to the British Museum and and, and make them even more accessible than they are, but they are accessible and they're amazing resources. So please do use them. And that is the last of my slides. And I am going to hand over to Hillary. So I will, I will, Hillary, are you there? Yep, lovely. Here we go. I'll, I'll go on silent if I can. Wonderful, thank you. We've, we've gone on one. Yeah, I'm just going Thank to you. go on silent. Hold on, I don't know how, if I can do that. Yes, there we go. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Gosh, that, that was uh, such a, a, an expert sweeping appraisal of what we do in the British Museum. And I thought it might be quite useful to sort of bury backwards to, to see how the British Museum can actually show us the origins of art history as a, a discipline because it, it does and it grows out of the enlightenment mind, spirits and curiosity. And in what used to be the so-called King's Library, built to house the Library of George III, that great polymath, we now have this gorgeous gallery. I have to say it's my favourite gallery in the British Museum. It's called uh, the Enlightenment Gallery. And if you go from one end to the other, you feel as though you're traveling across a very long century from really the end of the 17th century to a uh, uh, hundred years plus later. And 
as you can see, there are botanical things in the foreground. There's the bust of John Ray, um, who classified aspects of the botanical world. And right in the middle of the gallery, we can see the Piranesi vase, which gives a sense that the Enlightenment and a sense of curiosity in the Enlightenment goes hand in hand with the days of the Grand Tour. So that, of course, also had an effect on the type of things that people were collecting. And as you'll see, um, so one of the key figures in this story was this man, Winkelmann. So he's J.J. Winkelmann, and uh, he's living between 1717 and, and 1768. This is an engraving by Blom of him very much as a, an aesthete, and that would be an appropriate word to use because this, I would say sweepingly, is one of the founders, if not the founder, of the discipline of art history. So when you go to the Enlightenment Gallery, sure enough, there's a really beautifully arranged case headed the origins of art history. And there is a sense of, here's an Enlightenment mind who knew so many objects, had seen so many objects, particularly in the Vatican collections. So he was German, but he traveled around Europe a great deal and spends much of his life as curator of the collections in the Vatican. And there's that sort of curiosity, which then leads you to think, well, how can I tell the dates of objects? in another way. Can I do this perhaps by their changing style? And that very thought was really the, the hatching of the discipline of the history of art. And as you'll see from the next one, this shows uh, in a beautiful case in the Enlightenment Gallery, uh, a rarely uh, viewed book. It's by the amazing uh, Benedictine monk known as Bernard de Montfaucon. And he died in 1741. But you can see from this book, there is an open book. And on the right hand side of it are all these images of the same sort of object. This is a votive offering. So if you felt as though your hand were very pained, you wouldn't say, oh, I've got a bit of arthritis. You would say, I have devils within my hand. And you would have a cast made of a hand with grizzly beasties over it. And you would take this to your local priest and say, can you get rid of these, these evil spirits from my hand? Now, it was Bernard de Maufacon who thought, just like Winkelmann, although I think he was a tad earlier, um, actually, if you have some sort of um, date specific inscription on one object and similarly with another, but they might be in different styles, can you trace the stylistic development from one to the other and therefore be able to suss out the date of those? So this, this is a book which is called Antiquity Explained. And this is one of the first that really makes the point about how you can use style, as we might say art history now, how you can use style to detect the progress of one era into another. Next, please. Now, in all of this, you can also see, or I hope you can see from the next slide, that there is this so-called assemblage or assemblage of works of art in sculpture. And this, in a nutshell, really shows you the, the whole realm of the British Museum as it was pretty much in the mid 19th century, courtesy of products from the Grand Tour being bought or deposited in the British Museum. And we can see from this that there's an amazing mixture. There's Phidias um, in the upper levels of this watercolor by Stefanov. And then there are Hindu and Indian objects um, towards the lower part of this image. And then in between, there is a gathering of Assyrian and uh, Greek, Roman and Egyptian objects. So this shows that th this was their sort of world in the 1840s, 1850s. And it was trying to categorize, trying to work out where one culture fitted in with another. So this was the beginning of what then leads to the more global approach today. But in the 1840s, 50s, we can see that really there is a, a great penchant for, and a great belief that Greek Art was the best. Winkelmann, whom you saw earlier, propounded in his numerous uh, texts that Greek art was the most moral and the most beautiful. 
Now, leading on from that, we can see that um, this interconnectedness of the collections is going to develop greatly. And it is really useful to be able to walk from one gallery to another in the British Museum and to see Hellenistic art in, for example, the period of Alexander the Great, seen in the top right-hand corner here, a very distinctive bust of him in our Hellenistic gallery. And then on the top left, you can see in this map of the Indian subcontinent, which of course would have Pakistan nowadays on the, the western, uh, sort of northwestern part of this, you can see within that, that there is an area called the Indus Valley. And just to the sort of northeast of that is the area of Gandhara uh, or Handara. So this is really the area where there was a, a connection where really there were the crossroads of Asia. And the reason why we might think, well, there is Hellenistic art in this area and around Kandara, as shown by this uh, base or block, which you can see in the middle at the bottom of this view. This, this has very classical uh, Greek and Roman motifs, but at this time it, it, it's a Greek inspiration. There is a canthus, which is not usual to uh, the, the, the local culture in and around Kandara. So why is that there? Well, one of the reasons is because uh, the Greeks, of course, were very expansive in their uh, empire building and the spreading of their culture. And this comes to an all time high under Alexander the Great. So this is really what we can uh, see when Alexander was there, of course, in 327, uh, BCE. Have the next, please. Now, what I'd really like to look at now is the point about how, for many cultures and across time, there is a primacy of the human figure, obviously, because we are um, very often human centric. Uh, that's not just a humanist point of view, but um, this is what is familiar to us. It, um, we have religious and ritual objects, of course. Too. But when you look at this case in the Enlightenment Gallery, it shows again one of the key figures who was sort of thinking aloud in 3D through these figural uh, statues or figurines. And this is the amazing figure who should be much better known today, of course, and he is Richard Payne Knight, very famous for his construction of what we now call the picturesque today. But really, um, if you have students who would like to come to the British Museum or if you'd like to follow your own studies, this is really a good place to start because if you look on the left hand side, there is a figure who is, uh, we might say, um, the earliest, with the wisdom of hindsight, we will say is, is the earliest of this Greco-Roman display of these five figures. So the earliest is based really on Egyptian sculpture, ancient Egyptian sculpture, where there, it looks as though there's slight movement forward of a human figure, but there is very little space carved between the legs, the knees, the ankles. Then the next stage is to make a draped figure. So the drapery covers the distance between the legs, knees and ankles. And then beyond that, there is, as you progress in a right-handed way, there is a figure who is slightly uh, attenuated, who is slightly moving and has lots of space between the legs and ankles and knees. And this would be the high point. So it was thought in the 18th century into the early 19th century, the high point of Greek art. This was the kouros the ideal form of the male nude figure. But then as Payne Knight and many others came to think, there is a sort of mannerism after that. There is a going off the boil. And that's where you have the figure on the right-hand side of this case, who is really Roman, but has been heavily inspired by Greece. So just within those five figures, you can see a development of centuries of uh, sculpture. As you'll see in the next, please. Now this sort of heritage from the classical world, of course, comes through when you start to look at it in a rebirth of interest in the classical world in the Renaissance. 
So here we have one of the most sumptuous of drawings in the collection. We're extremely lucky to have 82 drawings by Michelangelo, and they show most of his major commissions. So this one is an academic nude male, uh, or it's a study, which is a, an academic study. And it's obviously made in the studio. It would have started with an hour's discipline of looking at the human figure. And we can see that this figure has great contraposto, much more than we've seen in the, the classical figures so far today. But there is contraposto, there is twisting of the form uh, throughout many objects in the classical world, but particularly when you get to the Renaissance and especially in the Baroque, of course. So I just want to show how this starts off as an academic study for a huge composition, which you'll see next, please. And in this next image, you will hopefully see, um, or I hope you will see, yes, thank you. You will see that this is a print after a lost composition. So that academic study was made for Michelangelo's massive composition in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. This was to mirror an equally adventurous composition by Leonardo da Vinci. And both of their compositions show battle scenes from Tuscan, particularly Florentine history. So here we see the record because the original um, was never sort of fully completed and the cartoon for it, the, the practice uh, design has uh, also been lost. So we just know it from prints like this, which is thought to be by Agostino Veneziano. Now you'll notice in the middle, there is a figure perched on the egg of, edge of these rocks, which are the, the banks of the river Arno, about 12 miles from Pisa, going in a westerly direction. And we can see this figure in severe contraposto, looking really uncomfortable. And he has all these soldiers who've been ambushed while having a, a dip in the River Arno on a very hot day as part of this um, uh, impending battle, again, which was between the Florentines and the Pisans. So you'll see, you just need to watch out for that figure who's in contraposto in the middle, the figure towards the right hand side who's putting on his tights or his hose over his wet uh, legs. And down at the bottom, you'll see two hands of a drowning man, a drowning soldier, just extending out of the water. Next, please. Now, the curious thing is that this becomes a really famous composition and it becomes widely known right the way across Northern Italy, especially, and then gradually the influence spreads beyond that. So here is Agost Agostino Veneziano again in two prints of very different dates. The left hand side is 1524 and the right hand is 1517. So Michelangelo's original design was 1504. But this is interesting because it's almost as though you, you, you can see Veneziano saying, I can't possibly put all of those figures in from the battle, but I'm just going to whittle it down to the most significant. So these were done in, in reverse in part. And the interesting thing is, I think that you have the key figures telling the story. On the left hand, lower left, <coughs> excuse me, there is the figure putting on his wet tights. Down below in the bottom in the middle are these hands which are coming out of a very dark space. They're not waters of the deep of the river Arno anymore. It sort of obviously thought crossed uh, Agostino Veneziano's mind that this would make more sense of it. And then in the background, top right, you have the soldier strapping on his armor. And there is just a piece of it on the right hand side. And as you'll see from the next image, all of this as a print, if we have the next slide, all of that as a print travels and it travels from Florence to Urbino, not too far away, but uh, quite some distance if you're on horseback. And there's this plate in our uh, British Museum Gallery 46, which shows elements of that design picked up by a Maiolica painter who rather amusingly has been more recently called, uh, identified and called as the, the master of the, the um, coal mine paint. 
painter. So uh, and this is because those hands of the drowning man have now become almost a potholer coming out of a, a dark space, so much so that someone has thought that it looks like a coal mine, which is not quite the case. And there in the background is somewhere that looks suspiciously like Florence or Pisa, and the figures again are uh, mostly nude, and therefore they show like the classical figures that this is the, the sort of focal point of getting uh, the best you can out of art. Now, you may see in the sort of top left of this plate that there is a cardinal's red hat and underneath it, a coat of arms. Next, please. Bearing in mind that that Maiolica plate is 1539 or thereabouts, we should bear in mind that it was made for this man, Cardinal Pietro Bembo, who had a wonderful sort of three-cornered life and this is so lovely because um, he, of course, became librarian of St. Mark's in Venice and uh, is a key figure um, in the Vatican, in Venice and also in Florence. Here is his portrait by Titian, which was painted almost exactly at the time. So he was very uh, proactive in his art patronage uh, during these years, the 30s and 40s. And may I have the next, please? Leading on from all of this and leading us into a new direction, uh, I just want to look at two categories really. And they are that when you look around the galleries, you can very often see an art historical development of different cultures. We've been thinking so far of the classical world inspiring the Renaissance Western art world, but you can do something similar uh, in similar exercises around other galleries. For example, here you have the Mexican gallery which shows us rather beautifully how you can see stylistically how you progress from or how you become familiar with Olmec or Olmec to Aztec to Maya to Inca uh, in uh, Central and, and Southern America. And they are very different types of art for very different purposes, mostly uh, ritualistic with often quite blood curdling aspects but they are great cultures of great age. They take us back to 10,000 years of human history. So many of you will be familiar, as Sarah has implied, with art meaning really the, the two-dimensional art of the Western world, which is beautifully shown at regular intervals in the Prints and Drawings Gallery, which you see here. However, as we'll see from the next image, uh, you can have your own private view of great works of uh, Western art at this end of this splendid room, this being the print room, the prints and drawings department students room, uh, which is an Edwardian structure. And at the far end of it is the Asia department students room. So on an average day, you might see works by uh, Michelangelo, Raphael and the Renaissance artists, or Anselm Kiefer or Picasso, at this end, at the same time as at the other end, um, Asian scrolls, for example. So uh, it's such an oasis. It's a real treasure trove of um, two dimensional art from uh, East and West. And I would urge you to, to go and have your own project and to consult the collections, which are fabulously rich. And as you'll see from the next uh, slide, these are really gorgeous and very easily accessible. And uh, you can uh, take out portfolios, you can uh, requisition portfolios. Here we have uh, a former curator, Anne Van Kant, looking at Rembrandt etchings. And as you'll see from the next, they include, I mean, stupendously rich collections, 300 drawings, 300 prints in multiple states. And these also show the interconnectedness of the British Museum's collection, because here you have on the left, the three crosses famously, and a Pisanello medal from the Department of Coins and Medals of 1432, which uh, relates to it. You might notice on the print that there on horseback is a figure who is uh, thought to be Longinus. He's going along with his great lance about to, um, uh, pierce the side of Christ on the cross in the middle and that figure visually is taken from more or less two centuries earlier than Rembrandt 
and it's taken from a medal by Pisanello, which he had in his collection. So you can see these wonderful connections across time and across cultures. Next, please. And I just really want to end very quickly by uh, bringing one last case study, and that is famously of uh, this great man, this great guy in British Museum history. He is Sir William Hamilton, our envoy to the court of Naples and Sicily for about 30 years of his life. It's a portrait by Reynolds at the, at the National Portrait Gallery on the left. And amongst his hundreds of so-called Greek vases, which came to the British Museum, is this one, a so-called Calyx Crater, which shows the apotheosis of a poet. It dates from about 1450 to 1440 BC. And although it's Greek, it was found in Sicily. And next, please. That is of direct uh, influence on uh, someone whom Hamilton knew uh, from correspondence especially, and that was Josiah Wedgwood. Wedgwood never went abroad, it's barely likely that he went to London. And so here we have the famous Pegasus vase of the 1780s. And wonderfully, uh, this was presented by Josiah Wedgwood to the British Museum. And if I just go through the next two slides very quickly, and we end up at the end, you can see that the Greek vase inspires uh, that Pegasus vase and this plaque made by, uh, they were both modeled by Flaxman, the great John Flaxman. And can I leave you with one question from my last slide, next slide, which is when is contemporary art or when does contemporary art become art history? Because for Wedgwood, that was the best, which combined art and industry in the later 18th century. He wanted that to be in the British Museum. This is the sort of thing that we collect right the way across cultures, even today. We're collecting, as you've seen already in Sarah's presentation, much in the way of contemporary art. One day, not too far off, that will be art history. So now uh, I'm going to pass back to Francis, uh, just hopefully for a couple of questions. Thanks, Hilary. That was fantastic. Um, just going to make sure I can see myself. Um, we've only got about five minutes left for questions, and there have been a lot of questions in the Q and A chat. Um, do you want to put your your, scre your screens back on so that I can see you? Anyway, I just wanted to thank you both for fantastically rich talks, and it gives us such a, a wonderful idea of the the diversity of the of the collection. Um, and also always wonderful kind of opportunities for, for visiting. I mean, I, I, I makes me feel really desperate to jump on a train this, this second. Um, I'm not quite sure how to select. I think what we'll do is we'll um, make the questions, put the qu questions live so that people can actually see all the, the range of questions. And hopefully there'll be time for you to maybe reply to people where they can get in touch with you individually if I don't have a chance to, um, to, to, to go through them. Um, there was a question for, for Sarah, I mean, there are quite a few questions actually for Sarah about um, yeah. copyright restrictions related to images from the print collection. Some of these are not so necessarily things that you might might want to answer, but perhaps other you could point people in the right yeah. direction. I mean, um, generally around copyright on if they're on collections online, it will tell you what the copyright is and whether you can use it or not. And if you're not, if it's not a free copyright, it will point you to our uh, picture library, and and you can you know, you can look into buying that copyright, uh, it depending on what usage it's for, but that's now all incorporated in collections online. So that, that really helps, I think. So you'll see if it's a free usage, you'll be able to download it straight away, if it's for educational purposes, if it's not for commercial purposes. Okay, that's great. Um, there was a question about virtual visits for <clears throat> children, um, children yeah. living outside the UK. Are they able to join these visits? Uh, in fact, one, I, I'm not quite sure how this, what this um, question really means, because it says, are they able to join the visits? And if so, what is, what is the cost of each visit? And I assume there are no costs attached to... Um, there are no costs attached, but at the moment we're not offering those to international schools. However, we are looking at what we can do for international schools. Um, that's because of our Samsung funding and the way that that kind of works. So, but we want to look at that for the future because we know that international schools want this, and we know we are 
going to be improving our website in relation to schools content for international okay. schools as well. Great, yeah. great. Um, there's also one about opportunities and resources specifically for freelancers beyond those that you've already described. Are there any other things that you might have, you know, like to include in the talk which would be of use for teachers or workshop leaders? Yeah, I think um, if anybody wants to get in touch with us, who's a freelancer who wants to think about working for us in different ways, we do work with lots and lots of freelancers. Um, so, you know, do get in touch. Do get, you can get in touch um, through our on our website, just through the info. It will come to me uh, if you're inquiring about, you know, working in learning or any of those different areas. So, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll just ask um, um, Hilary a couple of questions have been, which are, I mean, it's a very different kind of type of talk that you gave. So, um, so one person gave a very enthusiastic um, comment about which has actually been answered, I think, unfortunately, so I've lost it now. Um, but um, one person was asks about and this is actually a, a, an interesting question about um, well, first of all, one person asked about the, the difference between global art and world art. That's a quite a different thing to difficult thing to respond to. Another person asks about the the way that you that the British Museum deals with um, materials such as the fragmented history of Africa um, as disproportionate and disconnected from world history. Again, I don't know whether this is something you want to talk about or about how the museum is approaching issues such as um, uh, I suppose it's the you know how we how we deal with the interpretation within the museum yeah. and how um how the British Museum takes account of its own kind of participation in yeah. colonial history. Absolutely. And this is very much, you know, of, on our mind and um, in the work we do. And we're doing a, a lot of work and you know we're really embarking now on a massive project over the next what could be sort of 30 years I suppose or more mm -hmm. you know on really redeveloping um, the galleries in the museum and we're just starting that work on reimagining the British Museum but what we're very keen to do is to co-curate that and that is a complex thing obviously but it's working with colleagues from across the world but also with communities from across the world and we really need to do that. Um, just an example in terms of African history and integrating that more effectively we are do it we are starting to do that more and we're particularly in my department we're doing that with schools we've just started a new African kingdoms school session we've just done a lot of research a lot of these things are we need to do the research we need the PhD students we need the curators that can do this we really need that because we need to research the collections in order to actually tell these stories. And we, with the African kingdoms, it's been incredibly revealing. We are doing a schools workshop. We've got a resource for teachers that we're going to be sending out and sharing very soon. And we're going to be doing more films. We're also going to be making sure many more voices are represented. So it's not a very singular voice. It's, we need to have different voices. And you'll be starting to see that in our exhibitions. We're inviting different and voices to speak as part of the exhibitions and we want to do that more and more as we go forward so I, I hope that those things will really start to improve and we get that um, more integrated um, uh, you know uh, the way that we express things in the museum. Brilliant thank you that's that's absolutely wonderful I'm so sorry because we've now come to the end of this uh, session but I just want to thank you both for really enlightening talks really um, stimulating and I hope that you'll get lots of visitors coming your way. <laughs> thank okay. you so much Francis, and thank you everyone for coming. Thanks Anne. Thank you. Thank See you. you. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye.